you too. <laughs> um, thank you for finding a place to park, for braving the ice. That's significant. In the South, we know that ice is universally fatal anywhere outside a glass of sweet tea. So well done us for, for being here, for making it. Um, I'm going to apologize for mostly reading this. That's the best way to make sure that I can actually speak to everything and not speak for more than two hours, right? We've got two hours. Um, this is my first State of the School address here at the Lake Champlain Motor School. And I'm, I'm really excited. I'm excited to um, you know, share about the steps that we're taking toward a more secure future, toward a sustainable and joyful future. I'm really grateful to be here in partnership with the board, with the parent community, and with the faculty, um, who are just really incredible people. And it, it's, it's a delight to be able to share in this project together. Um, let's see, I do have a lot to say, but <laughs> First, let me just share a thank you to um, the majority of our community who was willing to come along with us on this earlier enrollment timeline. Um, I know that that was a big deal. The school asked you to take a leap of faith in doing that. Um, we tried to make it easy with this um, tuition refund policy. Um, but even so, the enrollment numbers that we have are basically a referendum on whether It was a little bit prettier last time I saw it. My apologies. Um, but on whether the community trusts our school to be making the right decisions and has confidence in the direction we're headed. Um, and frankly, it's, it's a huge relief to know that you do. What we have here, like Travis said, we are still experiencing attrition. There are people who are, are not able to come along with us in this next year for, for whatever reason, and we respect that. Um, that said, it's actually the lowest attrition rate that we've seen here in recent years, which is pretty remarkable given the much earlier deadline and given all of the uncertainty. The, um, based on currently signed contracts, including tuition adjustment, we're looking at $1,365,213 in tuition revenue. And then adding a careful estimate of those who are currently in the pipeline and the median mid-year enrollment that we've seen over the past few years, we end up with this net tuition revenue number of $1,580,731, which is only about $45,000 less than the net tuition that we were working with to create this current year's budget. That's really um, significant in how insignificant it is. Um, another thank you to everyone who contributed to the scholarship fund. It's because of you. Yeah, absolutely. Contributing to the scholarship fund, you made it possible for us to experience this year and to imagine next year, and that's tremendous. Um, we will be asking the community to follow through on this vision that was set out last summer of a three-year campaign, but we're ready now to begin weaning our operating budget off of it. So um, we are hoping to get to a point actually where need-based financial assistance is something that is funded through a dedicated vehicle rather than something that is budgeted as an expense. And um, basically that means that even though we are in awe of the um, philanthropic uh, impulses of this community, we're building next year's budget around this 67% uh, decrease in scholarship funds and a 23% decrease in the annual fund. You're welcome to donate more. We will save it for the following year. So this means that our overall budget that we're working with will be about half a million dollars smaller for next year than it is for the current year. Here is the rough sense of where I'm hoping that that will be coming from. And um, Gloria Irons, our business administrator, is uh, masterful at working with these, these budget tweaks and so on. But we're, um, and we'll share lots more as the budget makes its way through the process. Um, that slide didn't actually belong there, but I moved it up because I knew that some of you wouldn't hear anything that I said before we talked about those things. So um, what I was hoping to actually start with was just sort of sharing the story of, of our school as I've come to understand it. Many of you have been in community here for, for years or decades, but as a newcomer to the community, one of my sources of interest is getting a sense of um, where we've been, 
the school and I were actually born the same year. And that's a, that's a lot of history to, to take in and to absorb. Uh, when I talked with one of our founders earlier this year, she said, um, we were young and idealistic. We felt a deep connection to anthroposophy and the timeless wisdom of Waldorf education, and it seemed like everyone we talked to caught it. In marketing terms, at the beginning, the Lake Champlain Waldorf School occupied a blue ocean. Public education was a very different creature, and the market hadn't seen a child-centered approach with the arts integration and the content expression that's traditional and multicultural. Um, we were bold, we pushed the envelope, and we got it right time and time again. Our school defied the conventional wisdom about, was, about what was possible for a new initiative. We were unstoppable. We kept growing and growing. We grew in size, we grew in capacity, we grew in program offerings, we grew in traditions, and we grew in renown. We're um, a landmark school in the Waldorf movement. There are lots of, hello. Um, there are lots of reasons and ideas and complicated factors about sort of where that started to shift and, and why, but um, what's clear to me is that we haven't had a healthy and functional Waldorf governance structure lasting for more than a year for nearly half of our lifetime as a Waldorf school. That we are recovering from our third financial crisis in a decade, and that many of the founding and formative teachers and administrators have moved on in recent years, and that what it means to be a Waldorf school um, is in need of fresh imagining. Exit interview data from families who have left in recent years shows some definite trends. Former LCWS parent Paul Magnitz shared, what once felt cool and hippie and alternative and awesome now just feels scruffy and tired and uninspiring to a generation of parents who don't hold with that counterculture aesthetic. People nowadays want the facilities and communication to feel clean, modern, and efficient. That tells them that their children are going to grow up the same way, able to deal with the real world in an organized way. None of this is anti-Waldorf at all. It's really about a generational shift that still holds Waldorf as valuable. And the question that begs of what it means to be a modern progressive Walter school is a really exciting one. It's, um, you know, in fact, a big part of why I chose this school. But at the Lake Champlain Walter School, the teachers and the parents and the board are grounded but curious, open but also working out of their intuition. Oh. Rooted in anthroposophy, but no one here is playing a game of Steiner says. <laughs> Except <laughs> um, having grown up as a child of the movement and having visited over 30 Waldorf schools on three continents as an adult, uh, it's crystal clear to me that there is a traditional Waldorf movement that's ending and a progressive Waldorf movement that's beginning. And this school has the will and the capacity to preserve what needs preserving and to cultivate what needs cultivating as we move into a new era for Waldorf education, for the movement. The conversations that I've been privileged to have so far this year with each family in the community have been incredibly valuable. And the data here is based on open-ended responses, uh, which is great because it doesn't nudge people toward particular answers, but it's also problematic because it's really hard to say the sums. But this is my best um, effort at summarizing and synthesizing what you as a community love about LCWS on that last slide and, and hear what you want to see more of. It says I changed it in the executive committee meeting because I didn't want to hear Travis go on that anymore. <laughs> um, read off a couple of Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, academic vigor, adult, more adult education and parent communities, which is interesting because on that last slide, that was also one of the biggest things that people love about our school. Um, progressive approach, more connected to the here and now. Consistency and accountability, larger class sizes, more enrollment. Increased structure and boundaries that came about in a lot of ways, and I, that's one of the things I want to work on breaking out more. Transparency and communication, diversity, openness to change and innovation, stronger, more experienced faculty, more foreign languages, more continuity through the grades, affordability and energy of the TA process, like the whole, the whole process, not only the affordability of the school, um, that the teachers are cared for, 
that the school is more friendly to working parents with extended hours, vacation camps, things like that, meeting schedules. Um, financial stability for the school, program expansions, people talk about Eurythmy, about sports, about robotics, um, and other sort of things that they would love to see added. Um, using technology in the classroom, there were, there were several people who feel like that needs to be given more, more thought, and there's several people who um, wanted to see more of our school in terms of environmental education. Um, let's see. So I had, I had a demonstration that I wanted to do, but it involves broken glass. And um, but just by being here, we've all demonstrated that we're a remarkably imaginative group of people. So come along with me on this now. Okay, resting in a row on a ledge are one of those round glass Christmas ornaments and an orange and a bouncy ball. Um, mine is like sparkling. <laughs> they're comparable in size and shape, but they're made of very different stuff. They're snug and comfy in this little row on this little ledge. But we know something they don't know. We know that change is inevitable and that life involves all kinds of bumps along the road. It's a series of disintegrations and reintegrations again and again. So now, imagine them falling. It's an earthquake or a strong wind or a cat. It doesn't really matter. But um, falling was bound to happen sooner or later. That's what happens in life. And when it does, one of them shatters. One of them looks OK on the outside, but there's internal damage. And one of them bounced up higher than before and took off to the back of the Great Hall. So what are we made of? as an organization? How can we shape ourselves to be bouncier in the face of life's inevitable ups and downs? Another word for bounciness is resiliency, and there's a fascinating body of work emerging around resiliency in individuals and, and, and organizations. And this is really important because this lens of organizational resiliency is the difference for us between creating a plan that staunches the bleeding and allows us to limp along for a few more years, and a plan that's genuinely transformational and actually turns things around for us. So, it's all well and good for us to sit here being wonderful, but as we've all come to understand, we also need new people to understand that we're wonderful and to come and join our school community. Um, if you haven't yet gotten a chance to meet Julia Zhang Meisler, you're in for a treat. She's joining us midway through a successful marketing career, and um, she said something early on that really inspired me. She said, okay, so the population of Vermont is shrinking. So what? The population of the world is growing, and so is global wealth and global interest in water education. She's got a detailed marketing plan underway, and we'll be trying some exciting new initiatives. Uh, Travel mentioned, Travis mentioned the, uh, the, the commercial that we're working on recording. And we're, and then also we're working on cultivating these sister school relationships in five different countries to establish ourselves as a destination high school. The board approved this pretty revolutionary discount on the high school for Walder students. And so we're going to be reaching out to Walder K-8 schools throughout the country with customized marketing packets. Almost half of the students who joined our school fresh this year um, are coming from out of state to join our school community. So let's see, this slide, next slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how the school plans to respond to the needs of our students. Um, and that, that means the needs of our market. It's a little bit weird to talk about the market. Um, we, have, we have this thing that we do. We have this impulse that's, that's flowing through us into the world. And um, it feels a little bit crass to say, yes, but who's willing to pay for that? And how much are they willing to pay? Um, I, I acknowledge that that's a little bit weird, but it also is something that we need to talk about in this, in this context here. So I'm going to trust that you're all willing to move through that weirdness and come along with me on that, because uh, like it or not, a nonprofit business is still a business, and um, money is the fuel that businesses run on. Good businesses generate a lot of money, and um, tuition revenue is a key indicator of health for a school. 
which also means that our current financial situation means that we haven't been performing at the level that our market is asking of us, or we wouldn't be in a situation. So this is the graphic from that earlier slide also. It's, it's why people aren't here. Lack of academic rigor, administrative responsiveness and professionalism, teacher competence and accountability, affordability, learning differences, too small, class teacher leaving, logistics, trying to make the drive and so on, um, specific programs that aren't here, so someone really wants an athletic program that is different than ours, um, or negative social <coughs> dynamics that they've experienced. And this one is what our current families want to see more of. So, Jess, yes. Um, how many Um, no, there aren't there aren't that many um, families. I would sixty. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the charts that I have, it's more broken down, and I'd be happy to make those available to the community. Okay. Um, so in terms of you, know, this is this is great feedback from about what the community wants from our school, but. We're a Walder school. You know, we're part of a century-long tradition, a global movement. We're mission-driven. We're not just going to start jumping on trends. Um, but I've been studying these and working with these and trying to run them through the filter of like, well, what is the destiny of our school? And um, in the coming months, these ideas will be worked with more by the faculty and the board and the interim collegium to develop a strategic plan to guide our growth in the years to come. Um, in the somewhat grandiose spirit of the idea of a, a state of the school, um, the, where the, at the State of the Union, as Mr. Crummy was just reminding me, the president announces their legislative priorities. And so, so similarly, I wanted to share sort of my organizational priorities and initiatives. Some of these already have a path forward, propelled by the faculty and the board, and some of them don't. They're based on feedback from parents, conversations with teachers, a database um, comparison with other schools in or adjacent to the Walter, school, Walter community, um, the recommendations of the 2016 accreditation team, and a sincere effort to try to understand who we are as a community and, and what's being asked of our school and what will be asked of our students in this particular time and place. Um, a lot of these have been brought up or will more, but I want to just sort of run through them and, and, and provide this overview. This isn't necessarily the focus of tonight, but I do want to want to share it, preview it. So we've been talking about adult community. The PCC is moving into a different stage with different leadership, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to um, have its role be increasingly substantive as a vehicle for parental input into changes at the school. We're looking at rethinking parent evenings to create a K-12 curriculum for adult education as well, and then also processes for gathering parent feedback so that we can get a clearer sense of what's most helpful, what works best for you in parent evenings. Um, and then there's also this idea of doing some biography work and some biography circles together. Julia is working on this new marketing and outreach reach <coughs> campaign with the support of the entire administrative team, and lots of people from the board and the faculty as well and that would be a, a major emphasis. And there's also some programmatic initiatives. We are making this switch the, um, to a global languages curriculum that will still have French as our flagship language, but will offer these other opportunities for students to explore other languages. And um, I think that Madame Veronique is going to be um, planning some opportunities for parents to hear lots more details about that in the, in the coming weeks or month or so. We are going to have a homeschool program. We are not yet quite sure what that's going to look like, but it's going to be a new opportunity for us to sh connect with people who are interested in Waldorf education to offer something that, that works for some people for whom a five-day program doesn't work. Uh, we have this anti-bias curriculum that was part of the, the <coughs> benchmark around diversity that will be um, rolling out next year based on the Anti-Defamation League's program of Classroom of Difference. And then we're going to be looking at more camps, summer camps, vacation camps, things like that. Those will be opportunities for people to have a little taste of our school, and then also opportunities for parents who are, are looking for their child to have a different experience over, over break rather than rattling around the house. Or whatever it is people do. My kids rattle around the house. <laughs> I'm sure that there are more creative kids. Um, 
academic excellence. This is also a focus, and it has a lot of different components built in there. It doesn't mean a standardized test. It doesn't mean having, I don't know, mindless worksheets instead of handwork. Uh, it will mean some, some things, though. It'll mean a whole school integrated mathematics curriculum and a whole school integrated language arts curriculum. It will mean caring for our teachers better. We talked about the restoration of teacher pay and all of the, that, making it so that this is a place where teachers want to work, where they're able to see their future, where we're able to care for them over time, and so on. Curriculum updates around the traditional world of curriculum that are more in keeping with our time and place as we move into a, a, new, a new era as human beings. And then an integrated student support program where we're able to have um, in-house specialists who are working with students who have uh, learning